The Pentium was a big deal for Intel when the company released it in 1993. It was Intel's first superscalar microprocessor. This means it could execute more than one instruction per clock cycle, significantly improving performance over its predecessor, the 486. With a more advanced floating point unit, dual integer pipelines, a frontside bus of 66 MHz and a 64-bit data bus, cards were stacked in favor of the Pentium. Over the course of 4 years and 3 socket types, Intel was able to increase the frequency to 233 MHz, introduce the MMX instruction set and lower the core voltage from 5 to 2.8V. And in 1997, the Pentium 2 finally arrived, the worthy successor of the original Pentium. But that is not entirely correct. Even though many consumers upgraded from a Pentium to a Pentium 2, Intel released the true successor in 1995. The Pentium Pro The Pentium Pro was intended to replace the original Pentium, but low yields and high prices forced Intel to narrow its role to a server and high-end desktop or workstation processor. Perhaps the Pentium Pro was slightly ahead of its time and pushed Intel's manufacturing technology to its limits. Until the release of the Pentium Pro, the Level 2 cache was located on motherboards. Those external SRAM chips were relatively inexpensive, could be tested before installation and did not affect the CPU manufacturing process. The Pentium Pro did not require external cache chips, because it was the first CPU to have the Level 2 cache inside the CPU package. The primary reason why this CPU is a lot larger than its predecessor. There are two silicon dies below this golden lid. Below this black cover actually. One is the core and the second die is the Level 2 cache. The challenge for Intel was that cache and core could only be tested together once both dies were combined in the package. If either one was faulty, the entire multi-chip module had to be discarded. Models ranged from 150 to 200 MHz and were available with different Level 2 cache configurations. There is also a black version with a full megabyte of Level 2 cache. But I don't own one of those. Yet. Due to low yields and high costs of the Pentium Pro, Intel reversed course and released the Pentium 2 and early Pentium 3 CPUs with external cache chips again. The shift to the slot 1 cartridge provided enough space to position the cache chips close to the CPU core, which marked the end of cache chips on motherboards. Today I want to prepare a socket 8 motherboard and see if I can get it to post with one of my Pentium Pro CPUs. This board is from Intel, the VS440FX. The FX chipset is also the first chipset to support the Pentium 2, but we would have to wait another 2 years before those CPUs will hit the market. Our board here is also known under many other names as mentioned on the retro web. Unfortunately, the board has issues with one of the Intel ICs. Something must have hit one side and bent all those pins. And right around the socket, two capacitors are missing as well. They probably have been knocked off the board by whatever damaged the Intel chipset. Let's jump under the microscope and try to fix those issues. So you may be wondering how I ended up with 4 of those Intel CPUs. Well, I found them all at the scrapyard. Not at the same time, but it was over the course of 2-3 months. First I found a socket 8 motherboard which required a riser board to connect PCI and ISA cards. I don't know if that was a workstation board or a server board, but without that riser card the board was pretty much useless. And during another visit, I found this board, with a Pentium Pro 180 in it. It was still in its original desktop case, which usually means the board will be in pristine condition. Unfortunately, they removed the cover of the case and threw all kinds of other hardware in it, which most likely caused the damage we are fixing today. After I removed the board from the case, I didn't see any issues, I only noticed after I reached home. But in any case, I would have taken this board anyway. A socket 8 board is quite rare and you will not find it that often at the scrapyard. A few weeks after I found this board, a friend of mine who is working at the scrapyard sent me pictures of two more boards exactly like this with two Pentium Pros, 200 MHz and 256 KB of level 2 cache in it. Of course I had to get them. And now I have three of those boards. Unfortunately, the other two boards also require some fixing, but this will not be part of this video. So I found three boards with three Pentium Pros in it. But I have four CPUs. That last CPU is also a 200MHz Pentium Pro, but this time with 512KB of level 2 cache. 
This was a loose purchase so to say, because it came in a plastic bag with 5 other Pentium Pros of the same type. And you know what happens to CPUs when they are stored in a plastic bag, right? I have to fix all those pins. But this is something I will bother you in another video with. For today I just want to get this platform to post and then we will install an operating system. But instead of Windows 95 or Windows 98, I have chosen Windows NT 4.0. After all, this is a workstation or server CPU. So Windows NT seems to be more appropriate. But there is another reason. Pentium Pro CPUs have performance issues when they need to execute 16-bit code. And Windows 95 and 98 are a mix of 16 and 32-bit code. This is maybe something interesting to look at later, but for now I just want to see this system working. The sound of old western digital hard drives spinning up always reminds me of my 486. It had one of those drives with a capacity of 850 megabytes. But let's see if we get a picture from our Pentium Pro system now. And there it is. So far, this was a painless restoration. So, what do we have here? The BIOS is from American Megatrends in version 12. Not the latest BIOS, but also not one of the first ones. I think I have seen on the retro web that there were 3 newer versions released after this. Then we have 16MB of system memory, which seems quite low after equipping my 386 with 64MB. By the way, there is an update coming very soon related to those DIY modules. But let's get back to our board. Next we see the western digital hard drive which is connected to the primary IDE port and a Plexter optical drive connected to the secondary IDE port. And of course the floppy drive. So far so good. The only complaint we get is the time and date setting in the BIOS. I'm not very familiar with AMI BIOSes, but this implementation feels nice and solid. You get a handful of tabs at the top categorizing the settings. On the main screen is a summary of installed drives, memory and the BIOS version. Under boot options you can select the device to boot from, toggle the system cache, numlock and the PC speaker. And as a pleasant surprise the board supports booting from CD-ROM. We are going to try this in a moment with Windows NT. Under the advanced tab you will find details about the installed CPU and a lot more settings to play with. There is even a version of this board with an onboard sound chip. But unfortunately, none of my three boards have this feature. The BIOS is also able to tell us what type of memory is installed. In this case, it seems like we are blessed with 16 MB of FPM memory. Uh, I'm a bit disappointed with the memory configuration to be honest. All three of my boards have identical memory modules. But this board should support EDO modules as well. I really wonder what those systems were used for with so little memory capacity. They were workstations after all. Luckily, Windows NT 4.0 requires only 12 megabytes to run. 16 megabytes is recommended. So for today, we meet the requirements. But next time, I should try those 64 megabyte modules. Maybe we can get this board to boot with 256 megabytes and see if the Pentium Pro can catch the maximum memory configuration this board supports. And now we are almost at the end of this video. 
I will end it with a full installation of Windows NT 4.0, an operating system I have very little experience with. I just saw it running on computers controlling laser engraving machines and injection mold equipment. But that was over 25 years ago. And since I'm using a mechanical drive, I captured the sound throughout the entire setup process. So if you want to, you can listen to the Western Digital Drive write those bits and bytes of Windows NT 4.0 to the magnetic platter. Now I'm curious if you used or owned a Socket 8 system with a Pentium Pro. What model did you have? And did you ever use Windows NT 4.0? Please let me know your stories in the comments. Thanks for watching and I will see you in one of my other videos.